TV. William C. Davis is the author of Look Away. It examines the social, economic, and political background of the South during the Civil War and offers an alternative reading of the Confederates as revolutionaries. It's 45 minutes. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and especially to introduce Jack Davis, a native of Independence, Missouri. Uh, Jack earned his bachelor's and master's degree at Sonoma State University in California. Uh, he has had a wide range of experiences in magazine editing, book publishing, but for our pur purposes tonight, he's best known as the author or editor of more than 40 books and for his frequent appearances on television documentaries such as Civil War Journal. Uh, Jack has won the Jefferson Davis Award three times, an award given for book-length works in Confederate history, and he's been twice nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. He has written a series of deeply researched and beautifully written books that have had great appeal for general readers as well as for historians of the Civil War era. The range of topics Jack has covered is impressive, ranging from biographies of leading Confederate figures such as Jefferson Davis and John C. Breckinridge, to military studies of battles of Bull Run and Newmarket, to a wonderful book on the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Northern soldiers. During the past decade, Jack has published a series of books related to the political history of the Confederate States of America including his masterful work, A Government of Our Own, The Making of the Confederacy. In a time when political history no longer attracts either the general or academic interest that it once commanded, Jack Davis has literally breathed life back into this important field of study. And now, and for our purposes tonight, he has just published a general history of the Confederate States of America that is sure to become a landmark work in Civil War history. In his writing, and as you will soon hear in his speaking, Jack brings a breadth of knowledge, infectious enthusiasm, and impish humor to a wide range of topics. It's my pleasure to welcome William C. Jack Davis. Really tickled to get to see my old friend George Rabel and others here, and thank you all for, for coming out. Uh, maybe I ought to dispel some confusion. First of all, can you hear me at all? Okay. Uh, George referred to me as Jack. My name is William C. Davis. How do you get Jack out of William? You take some doing. Uh, it, it chiefly comes from the fact that even as a child, I hated the name Bill. If any of you have the name Bill, I am happy that you have it but I just didn't like being a Bill. And somehow Jack got uh, applied to me and I'm comfortable with it. So people are often confused, who's this William Davis and who's this Jack Davis? I thought I'd just chat with you for a while and then maybe take some questions afterward on what the book's about and what I was setting out to do. Uh, on the ride over here with my delightful escort, we were discussing Shakespeare and I could almost open up with uh, Mark Anthony's oration over Caesar. You know, I, I, I come not to praise the Confederacy, but to bury it. But I'm not. I, I'm not here to bury the Confederacy. I'm not here to criticize it. I'm not here to praise it, either one, nor to apologize for it. My goal is simply to understand it as a dramatic human event in our American past and as a far more complex experiment in democracy than most people realize today. Uh, unfortunately, we tend to view the, we don't get much Confederate history in, in our schooling and never have, but we, usually you only get about two weeks for the whole Civil War era in high school anymore. That's not much time to cram an awful big subject into. The result being that most Americans, if they know anything about the Confederacy, are operating from one of two one-dimensional stereotypes, either that it was a monument to constitutional liberty and to constitutional government and to strict construction of the Constitution, or at the other extreme, that it was a monument to ancient right-wing reactionary efforts to entrench slavery in American society. Both are wrong, but both are also right in a way, but it's far more complex than that. Yes, the, con the Confederate founding fathers 
were in some degree reactionary, but they were also reformers, believe it or not, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Certainly some of them were ideologues, but they were also idealists. I mean, who conceives of the Confederates as being idealistic? Yet they were. On the one hand, they appear to be standing up for state rights and localism, while on the other, the Confederacy will become, by 1865, the most socialized state in American history until the New Deal. They're very, very complex. They can't just be dismissed with simple one- or two-dimensional explanations. And that's what I wanted to get into in, in writing this book. I stayed off of the battlefield, not because military history is unimportant. Uh, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it was a war, stupid. And indeed, contrary to what a number of historians are saying recently, maintaining that the Confederacy lost, was defeated because of poor morale at home, uh, because the women lost heart in the war, because Confederates lost their faith in God. There are all these explanations. My favorite is that the South lost because it didn't have the atomic bomb. Well, they didn't. But they'd have lost even if they had it, because they didn't have a B-29 to deliver it. They're all wrong. The Confederacy was beaten on the battlefield. The Confederacy is beaten not by its own internal weaknesses, of which there are many. It's beaten by Abraham Lincoln and U.S. Grant, overwhelming Union might, and the willingness of the people of the North to stay with that war as long as it took. Uh, by 1865, the Confederates have achieved essentially full mobilization, meaning that every man between the military ages of 16 and 50 who was willing to be sent into the armies had gone. The only men who aren't there are those who are physically unable, or those who are deserters, or those who are simply hiding in the hills because they aren't willing to go. Even if morale was 100% wonderful, it can't create more people. And they simply never had enough men. But that doesn't mean that what's happening behind the lines isn't not only interesting, but very important. Everything that takes place on the battlefield is mirrored in what's happening on the home front. Everything that's happening on the home front is mirrored in the armies. You can't separate the two. And so what I wanted to look at was the political story of the Confederacy, the social story of the Confederacy, and most of all, most, most interest to me, the evolution of what I call Confederate democracy. Because the Confederacy is an experiment in democracy. You know, democracy didn't just spring up full grown in 1776 or 1787 or even today. Democracy is a work in progress, and it's changing constantly. It evolves in, in, in uh, reaction to crises, in reaction to various stimuli. And Confederate democracy, about which I'll say a little bit in a minute, I think was a natural branch in the evolution of democracy. <coughs> Just as Neanderthal man was a natural branch of evolution. He didn't work out. He couldn't compete. The Confederacy couldn't compete. That doesn't mean it was wrong. It just means evolution. You know, evolution doesn't mean improvement. It just means things are tried. Those that succeed last, those that don't disappear. The Confederacy is one that didn't succeed. Though for a, a dead branch of evolution, it's taken a long time to die. And that finally, I think, is, is, is the, the other reason I wanted to get into this subject because more than any other aspect of our American past, the Confederacy is still alive today. It's in the newspapers almost daily. It's reflected in our current political, social, and cultural values. It's still one of the dominant forces in our literature and arts and our media. We haven't turned loose of it, just as we haven't turned loose of the Civil War as a whole. And so it deserves, I think, to be understood far more than just these simple cut-out stereotypes that we like to throw at it. So a few, words about, a few words about what it was, or what I think it was. It's still controversial, but if anyone wants to know why secession came about, don't listen to a historian. Listen to the men who made secession happen. And they're unanimous in 1860 and 61 that it was political issues surrounding slavery. More particularly, just the one issue 
of the extension of slavery into new territories. And if you can separate yourselves from the moral and ethical revulsion we feel today toward the idea of slavery, put yourself in their shoes. In their culture, in 1860, slavery is legal. It's in the Constitution. From the pulpit, from the press, they are told that slavery is an institution ordained by God, that it represents the natural relation of the races if they are going to coexist together. So these men in 1860 are not apologetic about slavery being the issue that's driving them. And their concern is there's all this vast new territory to the West. It's been acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. It's been acquired like parts of Alabama in, by session or treaty from Indian tribes like uh, California and other areas. It's been taken by conquest from Mexico. All of us, North and South, contributed our blood in those wars. We contributed our treasure in those purchases. We ought to have an equal right to enjoy the benefits of those territories. But if Washington passes laws saying we can't take slaves into new territories, what does that mean? It means none of them are ever going to have a chance of becoming slave states. And slavery in 1860 is what defines power in America. Up until 1850, there had been an equal number of slave states and free states. I won't lecture you on the Constitution. It will put you to sleep in a nanosecond. But let me remind you of how Congress works. The House of Representatives is apportioned on the basis of population. But every state gets the same number of senators in the Senate. And legislation has to pass both houses of Congress. So long as there's an equal number of slave states to free states, that means that the slave states in the Senate can stop legislation that might be hostile to the South or to slavery. But if they can't take slaves into the new territories, there's no chance they'll be able to make more new slave states, which guarantees eventually the free state majority will get bigger and bigger, and the South is doomed to be a perpetual minority within this democracy. And when that happens, it's not hard for them to fear. Whether it's a real fear or not doesn't matter, because people and nations act on the basis of what we feel rather than what is. We're moved by emotion and fears and even paranoia sometimes more than by facts. And they have the fear that one day an overwhelming free state majority can attack slavery where it exists. And if that happens, Southern society is sunk. There are millions of people today who don't own automobiles. But would any of them get away with saying to you that petroleum's not important in their lives? Three quarters of the Southern people don't own slaves. But slavery was still vitally important in their lives. It defined power, as I've said already. It powered their economy. It defined social status and a host of other things. Even people who didn't own slaves had a stake in slavery. And again, if we can separate ourselves from the, the idea of how awful slavery is to us today, from a purely legalistic standpoint, it's hard not to sympathize with them, I think. The southerner slave owner can say, look, my neighbor in Illinois can settle the new territories with his wagon. That's his property. But I can't settle the new territories with what is legally my property because it's a slave. And that is the issue that's under agitation from 1850 onward. And that's the issue that in 1860 finally propels South Carolina to start secession. And I don't ask you to believe a historian, nobody does as a rule, believe the men who made secession happen. Robert Barnwell Rett of South Carolina, the leading fire-eating secessionist in the entire nation. He'd been preaching secession for over 35 years. In 1860, he declares publicly, slavery is the occasion, that is cause, of secession. Robert Toombs of Georgia, who was almost Confederate president, and who never forgave Jefferson Davis for getting the job he thought he ought to have. In 1861, if slavery is wrong, our whole system is wrong. Alexander Stevens of Georgia, vice president of the Confederacy, one month after the Confederacy is formed, speaking in Savannah, Georgia, the cornerstone of our movement is the inequality of the white and black races. And Jefferson Davis, Confederate president, this is about slavery. This is what they said in 1860 and 61. They all changed their story in the 1870s and 80s, 
when we have the beginning of the creation of the lost cause myth. This will come as a great surprise to you, I'm sure. Nobody likes to lose a war. But it's far worse to lose a war in a cause that the culture of which you're a part looks on as a bad cause. And by the 1870s, Western culture, universally, by which I mean not just the Americas, but Europe as well, regards slavery as a bad cause. And so the former Confederates set about the creation of the lost cause myth. We've lost the war, but maybe we can win the peace by retroactively changing why we went to war. And that is the first time that the state rights argument behind slavery starts to come out. But they, as I say, they were unapologetic about slavery being behind it, and we don't need to apologize for them. Well, that sounds very, that sounds pretty reactionary. That sounds pretty conservative, you know, trying to preserve the old landed aristocratic status quo. But then look at what they do. When they come together not far from here in Montgomery, Alabama, to frame this new confederacy. For a start, interestingly enough, there was no concerted plan. A lot of people up in Yankeedom thought that there was a conspiracy among these seceding states to secede and then form a new nation. Nothing's further from the truth. They weren't even talking amongst themselves. South Carolina went off on its own and hoped other people would follow. In fact, in October of 1860, before the election of 1860, the governor of South Carolina sent a letter to all the governors of the other slave states saying, if Abraham Lincoln's elected, will you secede? And every other governor wrote back saying no, unless South Carolina does first. There was no coordination at all. But once the session starts, they decide they need to get together and decide what to do next. And so they decide to hold this convention in Montgomery, but only to talk. Most of these delegates are sent there with no power whatever to do anything. They're sent to talk, and that's it. But once they get there, they realize that time is running against them. Lincoln's going to take office in March 1861. They can't wait for him to take control of events. They have to do it first. And so these men who have just finished one revolution start another revolution against their own states by taking power they don't have. And without permission, without authorization, they create the Confederate States of America frame a provisional constitution, then they frame a permanent constitution, they choose a president who chooses a cabinet, they set up a government, they begin an army, and then they go home to their state saying, here it is, this is what we have done. Take it or leave it. And in some cases, they had a hard time selling this to their home states. But at the same time they're doing this, remember what I said before about them being idealists and reformers, which I always see eyebrows go up when I mention this about the Confederates. For one thing, here's an example of idealism to the point of naivete, yet they thought it would work. They believed they could have a system in which there would be no political parties and no partisan politics. They'd had two generations in the old union of seeing what had happened. The crisis of the union is deeply tied up in the growth of political parties and the agitation between them as one party or another seeks power. I mean, this is nothing new to any of us. We see leaders in all of the major parties using us and using events to achieve power. Those who don't have it want it. Those who have it want to hold on to it. And they aren't always doing the people's business, are they? This is nothing new. It was the same in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. But they thought, if we leave the Union, we'll have left behind all of those sources of discord, and we'll be one big happy family. We'll all agree with each other. This lasted about 10 seconds because they were all politicians and they couldn't gainsay their basic nature. And in fact, of course, the Confederacy will be sort of a two-party system. There's a wonderful book on it by George Rabel, the man who introduced me, called The Confederate Republic, that deals with political parties and politics in the Confederacy. But what an idealistic notion that we can rise above raw, crass politics. And then there are reformers. When they frame their constitution, they adopt about 95% of the old U.S. Constitution verbatim. But they see problems in it that they hope to redress. They start civil service reform in America. They start term limits in America by limiting, I don't know if you regard that as a reform or not, but it begins with the Confederates who will limit their president to one term. They figure if we get a good man, we don't want to lose the last two years of him 
while he's wasting time running for re-election. In their constitution, they specifically outlaw pork barrel legislation. They don't want the people's money being spent by this congressman or that congressman to build a missile base in his home district to bolster his support in his home state. The wonderful irony, of course, is that several generations later, their descendants will become the accomplished masters of pork barrel legislation. They outlaw Congress appropriating money. Congress cannot initiate appropriations. Only the executive can. They don't want congressmen having the power to spend the people's money. Perhaps most interesting of all to me, we have this notion that the Confederates are these people mired in statute law. The Constitution is something written in stone, this deeply conservative look backward. Yet they make it easier to amend their Constitution than it is to amend the United States Constitution. They wanted a document that was organic, that could respond to challenges and to the exigencies of the present. It, they really are reformists. And of course, by the way, they give their president the line item veto. Jefferson Davis is the only one ever to have it until Bill Clinton had it, I think, just what, for two years, and then I believe it was taken away again. So these are people who aren't just looking backward. They're looking forward as well. And the way they administer their government, of course, shows almost immediately the impracticality of what they were hoping to do in having a nation state that was decentralized, in which power was diffused to the separate states rather than concentrated. If the war taught Jefferson Davis, above all, anything, it was that a weak, decentralized nation cannot survive in a crisis. And the story of the Confederacy from 1861 on is the story of the steady concentration of power in Richmond and in the hands of the president, as Davis has to uh, accumulate more and more authority to meet the crisis at hand. And hand in hand with that are increasing challenges to the individual rights of people who live in the Confederacy and to the rights of the states themselves. By the end of the war, the whole idea of state rights has essentially gone out the window. They have almost all been subsumed to the national authority. And as I said earlier on, the Confederacy by 1865 becomes the most socialized state in our history until the New Deal and maybe even more than the New Deal. By 1865, you have the government controlling production and distribution of staple products, establishing wage and price controls for commodities, instituting rationing, instituting prohibition, redistributing property, wealth in a way, instituting the first draft or conscription in our history, instituting prog uh, a program of impressment that is forcible seizure of private property for the military with compensation at government rates, public welfare, mostly by the states, but the federal government, the, the Confederate government somewhat involved as well. I mean, most of this sounds like what was happening here during World War II in response to another crisis. Yet variations of this are all taking place in the Confederacy. And by the very end, in uh, just after New Year's in 1865, Jefferson Davis will actually send an envoy, Duncan Kenner from Louisiana, abroad with an offer couched in a hint to European powers that he would be willing to use the government to abolish slavery if European powers would grant diplomatic recognition to the Confederacy, which they then hoped would lead to military intervention. And he does this without consulting the governors of the states. Slavery, which has always trumped rights at the beginning of the war, at the end of the war, is itself being trumped by the imperative for survival. Davis, like so many others, has gone through this incredible transformation where in 1861, He's something of a champion of localism. By 1865, he's the ultimate nationalist because he has seen what's necessary to preserve his nation. And the human story behind this is, is I think, the most compelling of all. The most fun in the research for this book, which took a few years, was going through all of the papers of the Confederate governors. People in America, North and South at that time, had this wonderful feeling of a direct connection between them and their elected leaders.
that, that we've long since lost because we're too big now. There are innumerable examples in the Union Army of Union soldiers who will pass through Washington who will simply go to the White House to see the president. You get in a line, and if the line moves fast enough, they can see the president, usually just to shake hands, say, how do you do, or to say, my captain's a jerk, or I'd like a promotion. A citizen had a right to go there. But even more interesting than that are the soldiers who don't even care about seeing Lincoln. They go to the White House because it's their house. This is the people's house. And you'll find examples of soldiers who will simply walk into the White House, go to the East Room, and sit down and use a desk for writing their correspondence. They have a right to be there. And in the Confederate States as well, you find tens of thousands of letters written by average citizens in the Confederacy to their governors, and they expect that governor to take an interest in their complaint or their problem or whatever it is. And I went through all of the letters, all of the incoming correspondence that survives for the Confederate governors. And that's where you truly, I think, see the heart and the soul of the common people of the Confederacy and where you can engage, you can gauge the experience that they went through. That's where you see the complaints of the shortage. That's where you see the plaintive cries of the mothers who have all these children and the husbands off to war and they can't get in a crop. That's where you see the people in terror because civil order has broken down in most of the Confederacy. Most of the men are in the war, therefore there are no peacekeepers at home. They're afraid of their slaves. They're afraid of deserters. They're afraid of unionists because the Confederacy is not a solid South. It's rife with unionists. Central Alabama had the county of Winston that's virtually all unionists. Mississippi has the county of Jones that's virtually all unionists. Every Confederate state will send regiments of white troops into the Union Army, except for South Carolina. There is no solid South, and these people are terrified at home. And they're hungry. And they're facing a very uncertain future. And that's all in the papers written to these governors. And what's also there is the stress and the strain and the trauma of what happens to them. In four years, the common people of the Confederacy went through about four generations of democratic evolution. Remember just what I said about the increasing socialization, the increasing assault on personal and property rights. Even in peacetime, that would be a lot to absorb. But under the strains of war as well, of shortage, of hardship, of hunger, that was an incredible trauma. It's no wonder that in 1865, when the war ended, the people of the South were just worn out. I think if anything were to come out of somebody reading this book, I'd hope most of all it would be some understanding of what these people went through and some empathy. I don't think the Civil War is something to be celebrated. How do you celebrate the needless deaths of three quarters of a million people and the blighting of a generation? It would be like celebrating the Holocaust. But I think we do need to know about it. We need to understand it so we can understand its impact on us. I think we ought to approach it with some reverence, but most of all with empathy for what those people went through. And I, that's what I have tried to do in the course of the book. I've gone on long enough. If uh, people have questions, we've got some time to have some questions or discussion if anybody would like to ask anything. Yes, sir. <coughs> Wasn't the... Uh the question is, wasn't there an article in the Constitution of the Confederacy forbidding slaves entering the Confederate States? They did continue the abolition of the foreign slave trade, uh, which had been enacted in the North in 1807 or 1808. There was a lot of debate over that. Uh, people like Rhett and others wanted the slave trade opened up again because they thought this prohibition was was a blight, was a stain on this institution that they thought was quite honorable. Uh, it's not because they had any opposition to slavery that they didn't want the slave trade continued. There are already three and a half million slaves in the South. That's more than enough. They don't need more. Furthermore, if you import more slaves, you reduce the capital value of the, of the slaves you have already. They had a big debate. I'll just going on from that for a second. They had a huge debate in the Constitutional Convention over the issue of whether or not they should admit free states. Remember what I said, they're reformers and idealists. They thought, we're going back to the original purity of the Constitution. We're erecting a new city on a hill here. 
And many, Jefferson Davis thought New Hampshire might secede and join the Confederacy. That's not a joke. He'd been to New Hampshire. One of their colleges gave him an honorary degree. He figured there are kind of people. But they were good conservative. It was a good conservative democratic state at that time. Many of these men thought, we're not the only ones who are dissatisfied with what Washington has been doing to the Union and the Constitution. Some of these free states, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, they may want to leave the Union and join us as well. But then they got to thinking, what happens if the whole Union breaks apart and reconstitutes itself under the Confederacy? And so what happens if we admit free states into the Confederacy? We'll rewrite back where we started. There will be a majority of free states in the Confederacy, and what have we accomplished? So they make it virtually impossible in their Constitution for a free state to join. They also in, uh, embed in their Constitution the provision that all Confederate territories will automatically have slavery. It's kind of pointless because the Confederacy has no territory. But it's an example of how they hoped to become a major power and a continental nation. And they hoped to acquire territory, uh, probably mostly from Mexico and Cuba, maybe even Central America. Beg your pardon? Well, in the New Mexico Territory, they could hope to take it from the uh, Federals, and indeed they do send an expedition out there uh, in 1861 to try to take it. But further than that, they make it all but impossible for any existing slave state ever to abolish slavery. Because if they start, if free states start to appear among them, they can still wind up where they were before. But ask yourselves, what does that say about the doctrine of state rights? A state has the right to embrace slavery, but it doesn't have the right to reject slavery. What it says is slavery trumps state rights. There was another hand up here. Yes, sir. Any of the uh, states that the Confederacy want to secede from the Confederacy? Good question. Did any of the states in the Confederacy want to secede from the Confederacy? I think Jefferson Davis wished Georgia would. <laughs> <laughs> mainly because of his governor. Um, they, the other big debate in the Confederate Constitutional Convention is this very issue of what about secession? They have maintained all along that secession is an implicit right, that a state that has surrendered some of its sovereignty to the federal government should have the right to reclaim it if it was dissatisfied with the National Compact. Just like a contract, if one person violates the accord, then the other presumably is released from the contract. While they came up with lots of rationalizations and lots of legalistic arguments to justify slavery, the fact still remained there was no explicit permission for it to be done, uh, for it to happen in the Constitution. So when the Confederates are framing their new Constitution, the big debate is, well, we should make it explicit. We should make this sacred right part of our organic law. But then some say, wait a minute, if we make it explicit in our Constitution, that might make people think we weren't sure it really was implicit in the old one. And then beyond that, others say, my God, if we make slavery an explicit right and one of us does to us what we've just done to the North, we've had it. So in the end, their Constitution is completely silent on secession. But there are a few, especially the the real hardcore fire-eating ideologues, people like Robert Barnwell Rett of South Carolina, who are immediately unhappy with everything that's happening in the Confederacy because it isn't doing what they want it to do. And some of them will, in fact, as time goes on, say, we made a mistake joining the Confederacy, we ought to secede from it and just go it alone. It's never seriously discussed. There are stories in 1864 when Georgia's invaded, uh, Sherman's armies are marching th toward Atlanta, that Governor Joe Brown, who is the great Satan of the Confederacy, so far as Jefferson Davis is concerned, he's a, he's a born controversialist. If Jefferson Davis said the sun is shining, Brown would say, no, it isn't, without looking out the window. He just had to gainsay whatever Davis said. There are stories that Brown was willing to talk about making a separate peace with Sherman and perhaps even trying to get the legislature to pull Georgia out of the Confederacy back to the Union. But a lot of that is, is murky and apocryphal. Certainly there were no attempts to, for, for a secession from the Confederacy at the end. Yes, sir? If so many records and archives have not been destroyed with the fall of Richmond, 
Do you think that Civil War history would be written much more differently than it has been? That's a great question. If so, me so much of the archives or the records of the Confederacy had not been destroyed with the fall of Richmond, would the story, would what historians say about the war be different? And I'm sure some elements of it are. Remember, history is not what happened. History is what people write about what happened. You know, which is, which is why history has no business being in the social sciences. It is a literary art, or ought to be. Um, most of Richmond, most of the government offices in Richmond were not prepared for the evacuation. Davis had not prepared the executive offices. Uh, Treasury, state, some of the other offices were not prepared. The only one that was prepared was the War Department because a new Secretary of War had come in in February 1865, a man named John C. Breckinridge, who came in knowing the game was up, and among the first things he did was begin preparing for the evacuation of Richmond, which he knew was going to happen. And he had the War Department archives boxed and on a train ready to get out of Richmond 137 years ago Tuesday, I guess, uh, and had them protected under guard all the way as the Confederate government fled south until finally, under his order, the archives are turned over to the Federals to ensure that some of the Confederate story could be told. But other departments, most sadly, I think, the State Department, were not prepared, and in the confusion on April 2nd, when Richmond's being abandoned, just boxes of papers are brought out into the streets and bonfires are lit, and much of the story of the Confederate State Department and diplomatic efforts simply went up in flames. Unfortunately, also, some of those papers got caught up in a breeze and are swept all over Richmond, contributing to the fires that were already going. So, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a sort of an Edgar Allan Poe-esque sort of, of poetry about the fact that the story of the Confederacy is being consumed in flames and itself helping to consume the Confederate capital. Who knows how different the story would be. The military story, I think, would not change, but much of the internal story of the Confederate government might. Anyone else? Yes, sir. With the spotlight being on uh, slavery in the Confederacy, uh, I, I would like you to ask me if I'm right or wrong on this, because I'm not sure. Is it true that during the war and after the war, the, uh, there were four <laughs> states within the Union that were slave states? Yeah. Uh, the question is, were there slave states within the Union during the war? And there certainly were. Uh, Missouri. Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. Delaware, a slave state? No, there's only about four slaves there by 1861, but it's still officially a slave state. Um, and it's no, it's no surprise that these are the states right on the border between the free states and the Confederate states. These are the states that are the most conflicted. They have some family ties, not just in slavery, but of familial ties with people in the Deep South but their business ties are mostly with the people of the North. They lose no matter what they do, or at least that's the fear they have. Kentucky will actually, in the summer of 1861, declare itself neutral. I mean, imagine if we went to war with Canada and Montana says we're neutral. But Kentucky simply couldn't decide. They lost no matter what they did. Um, Maryland re remains iffy of, as to which way it's going to go. And uh, the Lincoln government will exercise some somewhat extra legal coercion just to make sure Maryland doesn't try to secede. Because if it did, Washington, D.C. is isolated between two slave states. Uh, but overwhelmingly, even in Maryland, but especially in Kentucky and Missouri, the sentiment is pro-union. Now, these states will all send regiments into both northern and southern armies. But they, they're essentially more loyal to the union because their interests are primarily up there. Yes, sir. To what degree did economics uh, foster the union to fight with I'm sorry. The to what degree did economics foster the union to fight with To what extent did economics uh, impel the union to fight the war? They aren't really talking much about economics in 1860 and 61. After, now, the tariff issue, of course, had, and you want to put an audience to sleep, talk about the tariff for a while. Uh, but the tariff had ceased to be, there's no question, in the 1820s and 30s, there was a discriminatory tariff in place that put onerous burdens on southern consumers who tried to buy foreign goods. And this, of course, leads to the crisis of 1832 and 33, 
and the first time that South Carolina at least comes close to talking about secession. They don't, but at least that, that brings up the subject. By 1860, the tariff had died as an issue. You really don't hear about it after about 1850 because successive changes in the tariff laws have more or less equalized it. And finally, the Walker Tariff Act of, I think, 1857. Uh, essentially, it's just not enough of an issue for people to get excited about. The proof in the pudding is that in March 1861, after they framed their constitution, when the Confederates are enacting all their statute laws, they impose the Walker Tariff Act on themselves. What about the uh, economic impact of the export tariffs on the funding of the federal government? What about the economic impact of export tariffs on funding the funding, the funding of the federal government? I'm a little hazy on that. Don't you hear love it when a historian says, I don't know? Well, <laughs> what I'm questioning is the export tariff, which they had also, mm -hmm. being, uh, was greatly derived from agricultural products, mostly agricultural products that were needed in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And all of the funding of the federal government was derived from the tariff. Well, actually, it's, it's also derived from the sale of the public lands. There, there are two sources of it. Uh, Can the 11 states that seceded were the breadbasket for the cotton products? Yeah, okay, okay I'm with you. Yeah. There is an argument that's made that uh, it's made after the war chiefly by a guy named Alfred Taylor Bledsoe, um, who interestingly enough, even the other authors of the Lost Cause myth ignore. But he makes this argument that Lincoln really wasn't fighting the war to hold together the Union, that he was doing it to keep a grip on these southern tariffs. Well, there's a basic problem with it, and I think anybody can probably figure out what you would do. The tariff is the prime, uh, tariff exports and import uh, excise and duties are the primary source of income for the federal government, also sale of the public lands. But in those days, correct me if I'm wrong, George, you may know or, or will, on a daily basis, the tariff produced maybe 20 or $30,000 a day. You know, six or seven, eight million dollars a year. You know, the whole federal budget was under 10 million dollars a year. That's less than a congressman spends on a fact-finding trip to Bermuda with his secretary today. The Civil War costs the North a million dollars a day. I think somebody would stand up and say, wait a minute, we're spending a million dollars a day to hold on to $20,000 a day and figure that ain't a good deal. Uh, interestingly enough, tariff income in the north into, into and out of northern ports increases once the war starts, even though they no longer have all those southern ports as points of entry and export. So I, obviously no nation wants to lose a substantial portion of its income, but I think Lincoln would have had an enormous time persuading farmers in Illinois and Ohio, let alone uh, uh, Democratic politicians in uh, New Hampshire or Pennsylvania to prosecute that bloody, that costly a four-year war to hold on to tariff revenue that thanks to northern growth in industry is already growing from their own exports. And if I talk about tariff anymore, I'll put me to sleep. <laughs> so. Yes, ma'am. There's, yeah, there's, this, have you got this other than Ben Waddy leading the last group of survivors? Well, there's no question that some, some Cherokee and other Indians were, were property owners and did own slaves. Uh, particularly, who's a John Ross, I think, who's one of the early leaders of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, I don't know if Stan Waddy was or not, but, but certainly some of them did. You know, there are some free blacks in the Confederacy who own slaves. Be slavery is a sign of status. A slave is also someone to, to help you with the produce of your farm or to, or to run your business. Anybody could own a slave. You didn't have to be a citizen. Uh, whether or not that's the reason the Cherokee largely sided with the South is hard to say. And I, I confess I don't know a lot about that. The poor Indians, especially out in my part of the country, Kansas and Missouri and thereabout, were kind of used by both sides, taking advantage of old intertribal rivalries.
So if one tribe of Indians sided with the Confederacy, their ancient enemies would side with the Union. And neither side used them very well or took very good care of them. Yes, sir. God, I hate reviewers. <laughs> Why do I put so many big words in books? That's so, because nobody will, so nobody will know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll try to use shorter words. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I think on that note, we'll close. How do you top that? Thank you all very much for being here tonight. And I guess if folks want me to sign books, I'll just sit down over here and start... William C. Davis is Director of Programs at the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. Look Away, A History of the Confederate States of America is published by the Free Press. And you can visit thefreepress.com to get more information. I'm not here to bury the Confederacy. I'm not here to criticize it. I'm not here to praise it, either one, nor to apologize for it. My goal is simply to understand it as a dramatic human event in our American past and is a far more complex experiment in democracy than most people realize today. Uh, unfortunately, we tend to view the, we don't get much Confederate history in, in our schooling and never have, but we, usually you only get about two weeks for the whole Civil War era in high school anymore. That's not much time to cram an awful big subject into. The result being that most Americans, if they know anything about the Confederacy, are operating from one of two one-dimensional stereotypes. Either that it was a monument. Davis Award three times, an award given for book-length works in Confederate history, and he's been twice nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. He has written a series of deeply researched and beautifully written books that have had great appeal for general readers as well as for historians of the Civil War era. The range of topics Jack has covered is impressive, ranging from biographies of leading Confederate figures such as Jefferson Davis and John C. Breckinridge, to military studies of battles of Bull Run and Newmarket, to a wonderful book on the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Northern soldiers. During the past decade, Jack has published a series of books related to the political history of the Confederate States of America including his masterful work, A Government of Our Own, The Making of the Confederacy. In a time when political history no longer attracts either the general or academic interest that it won... Confusion, first of all. Can you hear me at all? Okay. Uh, George referred to me as Jack. My name is William C. Davis. How do you get Jack out of William? It takes some doing. Uh, it, it chiefly comes from the fact that even as a child I hated the name Bill. If any of you have the name Bill, I'm happy that you have it. But I just didn't like being a Bill. And somehow Jack got uh, applied to me and I'm comfortable with it. So people are often confused, who's this William Davis and who's this Jack Davis? I thought I'd just chat with you for a while and then maybe take some questions afterward on what the book's about and what I was setting out to do. Uh, on the ride over here with my delightful escort, we were discussing Shakespeare and I could almost open up with uh, Mark Anthony's oration over Caesar. You know, I, I, I come not to praise the Confederacy, but to bury it. But I'm not. I'm TV. William C. Davis is the author of Look Away. It examines the social, economic, and political background of the South during the Civil War and offers an alternative reading of the Confederates as revolutionaries. It's 45 minutes. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and especially to introduce Jack Davis, a native of Independence, Missouri. Uh, Jack earned his bachelor's and master's degree at Sonoma State University in California. Uh, he has had a wide range of experiences in magazine editing, book publishing, but for our pur purposes tonight, he's best known as the author or editor of more than 40 books and for his frequent appearances on television documentaries such as Civil War Journal. Uh, Jack is one that Jefferson has commanded. Jack Davis has literally breathed life back into this important field of study. And now, and for our purposes tonight, he has just published a general history of the Confederate States of America that is sure to become a landmark work in Civil War history. In his writing, as you will soon hear in his speaking, 
Jack brings a breadth of knowledge, infectious enthusiasm, and impish humor to a wide range of topics. It's my pleasure to welcome William C. Jack Davis. Really tickled to get to see my old friend George Rabel and others here, and thank you all for for coming out. Uh, maybe I ought to dispel some.